April, 1943. In an Auschwitz concentration camp, bodies are piled on the ground. Nazi soldiers climb over them. Gold teeth are extracted. Wedding rings are torn from fingers. Just three years earlier, art galleries and museums throughout Europe are stripped bare. National banks are looted. By 1945, Germany has amassed stolen property worth billions and billions of dollars. The gold is melted down into bars. But when the war ends, everything has vanished. What happened to the gold and other riches? The answer lies in an odyssey that extends from the death camps in Europe to Swiss banks to a group of men pursuing those responsible for hiding these riches. This is the story of the hunt for Nazi gold, one of the best kept secrets of World War II. The story of the hunt for Nazi gold begins with the man responsible for the Holocaust. Adolf Hitler's drive to make Germany the richest and most powerful nation on earth involves robbery on a massive scale. He has no qualms about stealing from neighboring states, emptying their national banks, and confiscating their national art collections. An art fanatic, Hitler plans to build the finest art galleries in Europe with the very finest works stolen from French, Dutch, and Russian collections. He desperately needs cash to buy new weapons. His first act of treachery is against his own people. Racial hatred lies at the heart of the Nazi regime. Hitler demonizes German Jews, blaming them for the country's defeat in World War I, despite the fact that Jews fought side by side with Germans. Jewish businesses are boycotted. Jewish shops are covered in anti-Semitic graffiti. Their owners humiliated. Nazi thugs are encouraged to attack Jews in the streets. Many Jewish businesses are forced to shut down. Top Nazis exploit the horror by buying up Jewish companies cheaply. Rich Jews such as Louis de Rothschild have their grand homes taken over and looted. Many wealthy Jews travel to neutral countries. They place their money for safekeeping in foreign banks. Because they thought that if they could save their money, they could somehow bargain to save themselves. They really thought that they still had a negotiable position if they had something to negotiate with. And that's why they wanted to get it out, because they assumed that that could be their only ticket to safety. Switzerland is one of the most popular financial havens for Jewish businessmen. Swiss banks are famous for their security and strict privacy rules. Jewish businessmen hope to retrieve their fortunes after the worst of Nazi oppression is over, or so they think. But conditions deteriorate in Nazi Germany. During the 1930s, political opponents of Hitler are detained in concentration camps. From 1942 onward, concentration camps become death camps for the systematic murder of the Jews. The situation is chilling. Upon arrival at the camps, each person is stripped of all valuables. Many have their hair shaved to be used as stuffing for Nazi furniture. Valuables not removed from the living are stripped from the dead. Gold fillings are torn from the mouths of corpses. A few are fortunate. They become slave laborers. Most meet death in the gas chambers. I can't even uh, describe you the way they were treating us. They weren't treating us like people. They were treating us like animals. Right away, they were just looking in your mouth. And my father, before he, they took us in, 
to the shower rooms, they pulled out his crowns from his mouth and uh, if it hurt it, he couldn't, you know, uh, they didn't use nothing, they just had a pair of pliers and they like, if you tie down a horse and this is the way they pulled it out. The looted gold is melted down into bars and sent off to SS bank vaults. Much of the gold ends up in Swiss banks where it lies hidden for years. But not only does Hitler steal fortunes from wealthy Jews, before the war, huge loans and political contributions are coerced from German bankers, industrialists, and other businessmen. They hope to gain favor or simply survive in the Third Reich. The price for protection against Hitler and his henchmen is a high one. If you don't pay, you could end up in a concentration camp. With a war chest bulging with stolen money, Hitler unleashes the next stage of his great heist. March 1938, German troops enter Vienna. They claim they are uniting all German peoples under one banner. The invasion is called Anschluss. As part of this forced union with Nazi Germany, the Austrian National Bank is liquidated. All of its assets are transferred to the German Reichsbank. In his first foreign theft, Hitler seizes nearly 200,000 pounds of gold, a total value then of over 100 million US dollars, today worth a billion dollars. A year later, Hitler turns on Czechoslovakia. Under the guise of protecting Germans living in the Sudetenland, he annexes the rest of the country to his growing empire. But before the Germans assume full control over the country, the Czech National Bank in Prague has the foresight to shift some of its assets to the Bank of England via Switzerland. Reichsbank officials quickly step in. They redirect $40 million of Czech gold to Germany. They even track down the gold already transferred to England and force Bank of England officials to hand over another $26 million worth of gold. Foreign invasion becomes a profitable business for Hitler. Funneling the finances of entire countries into German and Swiss bank accounts goes into full swing. The road to world conflict has been laid, and it is paved with stolen Nazi gold. September 1939, darkness envelops Europe. Britain and France threaten war if Germany invades Poland. Hitler calls their bluff. He bombs Warsaw and sends in his troops. Nazi high command has already profited from foreign invasion. It hopes to do the same in Poland. But when the Nazis fight their way into Warsaw, they are in for a disappointment. Bank of Poland officials have already moved over $60 million worth of gold out of the country. It has been transported through Romania and Turkey to France, where it is deposited in the French National Bank. Hitler now turns westward. His armies storm into the Netherlands. May 1940, the Dutch surrender to Germany. Reichsbank officials ransack the Bank of Amsterdam. Over the next five years, they redirect $163 million of gold to the Third Reich. Belgium is next, but its national bank officials funnel the entire country's finances to French banks. June 1940. All three nations lose control of their national fortunes as France falls to the invading Germans. Still, 
A large quantity of Polish and Belgian gold has been shipped to the West African port of Dakar. An Anglo-French force tries to rescue the stash, but Vichy French naval units tied to the Nazis force the Allies to withdraw. Some $200 million of French gold is also shipped to Martinique, another French colony in the West Indies. Prolonged negotiations between Vichy France under Marshal Pétain and Nazi Germany follow. Hitler wants the gold, but he doesn't want to occupy Vichy France to get it. The Fuhrer intends to force the Vichy regime to hand over Polish, Belgian, and French gold. $200 million worth of Belgian gold ends up in Nazi vaults. But by late 1942, as the French seem ready to hand over the Polish gold, the Allies are victorious in North Africa. Nazi access to gold stored in West Africa is severed for good. The Nazi conquest results in the most massive money shift in world history. The reserves of entire countries are gone. A sea of gold keeps the war driving forward. But where do the Nazis stash the treasure? Some of it is stored by the Reichsbank in Germany. But much of it is used to acquire an even more valuable asset, hard currency. Hitler needs cash to pay for his weapons. And the best place to change looted gold into hard currency is the capital of European banking, Switzerland. Switzerland has long taken pride in its neutrality. It uses its international stance to enhance its reputation as a safe haven for foreign money. Its banks thrive on an image of top security, privacy, and fair dealing. But in World War II, this image masks a terrible secret, a secret that now casts a long shadow over its supposed neutrality and fair dealing. The Swiss claim they stand apart from Nazi Germany, but the fact is they are very much involved with the Third Reich. Their seven-man federal council, headed by Marcel pillet golaz decides that in order to preserve Swiss freedom, they will have to do business with Hitler. This means that Switzerland will not open its borders to thousands of Jewish refugees who hope to escape to neutral territory and who have deposited millions into its banks. To do so would provoke the Nazis. They might make Hitler furious and he would decide I have to attack those people who seem to be friendly with the Jews. One witness recalls how the Germans had a J printed in each Jewish passport. And we had to have a photo where the link O was visible. Also, wie für die Verbrecherkartei. Und dann hat man müssen äh, Fingerabdrücke geben. Und es ist natürlich schon sehr diskriminierend. Und für viele hat das bedeutet, dass sie dann einfach zurückgewiesen worden sind. Man hat sie gerade erkannt. Und das ist das Todesurteil gewesen. Jews who reach the Swiss border are sent back to face certain death in Nazi death camps. Many Jews stopped at the Swiss border commit suicide rather than go back. In order to buy the weapons he needs to fight the war, Hitler needs Switzerland to take his gold and launder it into hard currency. Many weapons are manufactured in Swiss factories, so the Swiss make even more money, selling vast amounts of ammunition, weapons, and other vital war materials to Nazi Germany. 